Europeans and Americans are trying to bring the whole world into this disgraceful policy, the actions of the West at the moment when immediately uh, as a, a, a Russian Russophobia, a regular Russophobia was was encouraged and the, the Russian language prohibited. This is racism, which apparently didn't uh, disappear. It wasn't, it's no longer latent. It is now obvious. And this is being spread and proliferating. The same with those slogans, uh, Ukrainians, uh, choose who you're with. And a few uh, years later, there were other elections. The candidate that was not uh, embraced by the West didn't win. And the West did everything possible to raise a wave in Ukraine and to compel its subordinate Ukrainian officials to uh, uh, hand over the issue to the Constitutional Court. And the Constitutional Court, which is supposed to su uh, protect the Constitution, set out a third round of elections, which is not enshrined in the Constitution, and the necessary candidate for the United States was then selected. So you know, in December of 2013, there was a publication of what leaked uh, the uh, recording of the television, uh, the dis discussion between Victoria Nuland and the American ambassador in Kiev. The, Amer the American ambassador in Kiev was being reported to, this was back in December, about which politicians, was reporting which politicians need to be prepared for the new government even though uh, there was more than a year before the elections, so a certain likelihood of an abnormal uh, transfer of power, power was possible, and Newland named a few names which he thought had to be included in the leadership of Ukraine. And to this, the U.S. ambassador in Kiev said, well, you know, this specific individual, he is not supported by the European Union. Do you remember what she answered? Fuck the EU. So this is the relationship, this is the truth. And the relationship today is the same. The whole coup, the turnaround with Germany, France, and Poland signed on, their ministers signed on to a guarantee of the creation of a government of national unity, which would deal with preparations for early elections in five to six months. During those elections, the opposition would certainly have won. But instead of complying with the agreement, and at least respecting the authority of European countries who who place their authority at their authority at stake the following morning they didn't wait very long the next morning they seized administrative uh, buildings and then at uh, the they uh, uh, square they proclaimed uh, celebrate uh, uh, congratulate us we created a government of victors not na of national unity but a government of, vict of victors there's a big difference here and this was something that was seen repeatedly, the fact that the United States views the current situation around Ukraine as, as some kind of a, of, of, a, of a yardstick by which their capacity will be measured to remain a hegemon. This is absolutely clear to me. I'm not comparing the situations. However, when the United States uh, launched their aggressive misadventures in Yugoslavia, in Iraq, in Libya, when they invaded Syria without any right to do so. They, and in Afghanistan, by the way, also, they announced areas of their interest in areas tens of thousands of miles from American shores. And in parallel with these processes, when they sowed chaos everywhere to then have uh, the American fish fished out of those muddy waters, they advanced NATO eastward, eastward, and further eastward. NATO, a defensive alliance. When the Soviet Union existed, uh, when there was a Warsaw Pact, when the Berlin Wall was up, a concrete wall and an imagined wall between the two blocks, Yes, it was understood that they were defensive. They were defending themselves from, as they viewed the aggressive Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact. But then there's no longer a Soviet Union, no Warsaw Pact, and they are now defending themselves hundreds, tens of thousands of kilometers from the line that was then understood. They simply decide, okay, we will defend ourselves here. Then we will defend ourselves there. They announced that NATO now, as a defensive alliance, is accountable for security in the Indo-Pacific region, as they put it.
So the next line of defense of NATO, the line of protection, will be the South China Sea. I have no doubt about that. Today I spoke about this during the general debate. How long will this situation go on? I won't guess. I, president was asked, and the response was, we see our purposes which were proclaimed. We are working towards the achievement of those goals. We have a new mem on TikTok. Please. <laughs> new what? A new mem. Mem. <laughs> yeah. EU, something about EU and sex. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you, Minister Lavrov. Michelle Nichols with Reuters. Uh, we've heard Russia's explanation for its invasion of Ukraine, but could you tell us what the end game is? Is the end game to overthrow the government in Kyiv? And how much pressure is Russia coming under from China to end this war? Uh, the goals of the operation have been set in President Putin's statement on the 24th of February. We cannot tolerate. Tell me, for example, uh, and I try to allude to some of the things which are absolutely intolerable. If, if imagine for a second, Reuters, right? Uh, if uh, Ireland prohibited English in schools, in uh, communications, in uh, movie theaters, or if Belgium did the same to the French language, or Finland to the Swedish. Can you imagine any of these uh, developments? I can't. But with, it would have been considered outrageous immediately. And there would have been a scandal and action, I, I have no slightest doubt, not to allow this to happen. But in case of Ukraine, for long, long years, the policy to eliminate anything Russian never drew any attention from uh, media outlets uh, in the West. And not only media outlets. We have been presenting these cases and calling for some action in uh, OSC, Council of Europe, United Nations, in relations between Russia and NATO, which at that time existed, and our contacts with the European Union, zero. Just like in the previous decades, after the Soviet Union disappeared, uh, our insistence that European Union must end discrimination of Russians in Latvia and Estonia were not heeded at all. Absolutely. We have very deep conviction that our Western neighbors have racist instincts vis-a-vis Russia as a country, Russia as a nation. If you have any, uh, any, any fact which will disprove uh, what I am just saying about discrimination of Russians in Estonia, Latvia, and in Ukraine, where legislation was passed prohibiting everything, then, of course, uh, we can, we can uh, discuss what analysis uh, you might offer. So, um, you call it aggression, uh, uh, you call it annexation, it's, it's, you're right. My answer is very simple. Don't try to judge from your office or from New York. Go to Crimea, talk to the people. Uh, nobody does it except uh, some brave politicians uh, who are not in the elite, you know, system, uh, systemically. Go to the East. Anybody of you, did, did you go to, to Donbass during the eight years of the war, when the Minsk agreements were raped every day? No. The Russian TV was broadcasting the situation on the Donbass side of the line of contact daily live. And the damage to the civilian infrastructure, the killings of the uh, peaceful population, was broadcast regularly. And we have been asking a question. Why uh, don't Western journalists do the same on the Ukrainian, so, but Minister, on, sorry on the Ukrainian side uh, of the uh, line of contact? 
because on the Ukrainian side of the line of contact, the damage was inflicted only by return fire. And it, it would be seen immediately. So uh, I understand that you want to ask a question which would allow you then uh, to write that I uh, could not answer your question, but I no, think... I'm, I'm after what's the military end game. We understand your I was just asked by our Chinese friend about the military end game and the, the goals of the operation. You should read Putin more often and carefully. He announced everything on the 24th of February. Read it and you will, you will get it. And what about China? Pressure from China to end the war? This, this I don't understand at all. Your, your president said last week that President Xi had raised concerns about the war with President Putin. Did he say, did he say pressure from China? He said did he say pressure from China? He said concerns. So no, no, I'm, no. I'm asking yes you. Yes or no? Did he say pressure from China? I'm asking you, though, are you coming under any pressure? I don't know. I'm asking you. No, 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 no. You ask me what about how do we feel under pressure from China? No, Look, said, let's, be, let's be honest. Are, let's are you be coming honest. under any pressure from China? Uh, look, you may, you may uh, tell your readers, listeners, viewers uh, that uh, I avoided your question, to answer your question. Mike, you mean you don't understand Russian? Still. High time to learn. Uh, sorry. Uh, Sergey, Viktorovich, no. Sergey Viktorovich, on the margins of the General Assembly, you've had many different meetings with your colleagues from Africa. Could you please tell us, during those talks, first of all, did you discuss the um, situation surrounding Ukrainian grain and Russian fertilizer, which is in European ports, and which our now probably former Western partners are refusing to release? to these poor countries. And second question, from your point of view, are there any new tracks or new areas that have emerged during discussions of these issues with American partners? And in general, in your point of view, how is the dialogue with African countries developing? Is there anything new or interesting that we don't yet know about? Yes, we spoke with many African colleagues. We spoke first and foremost about our bilateral relations with each of the African countries. We have growing trade and investment activity, although, of course, the overall figures are still a long way behind the Europeans and particularly behind Chinese companies, but the prospects are very promising. We have a lot of projects and a lot of plans, and we are putting together a robust package of agreements for the second Russia-Africa summit, which we plan to hold in the middle of next year. Food security, of course, is of interest to everyone. Everybody supports efforts to end the barriers that have been erected by the European Union, London and Washington in respect of the export of Russian fertilizer and grain. Everybody welcomed the package deal, which upon the initiative of the Secretary General was concluded on the 22nd of July in Istanbul, and which at long last forced Zelensky to demine Ukrainian ports. He had been refusing to do that since March. In March, Russia and Turkey proposed that he let through um, those ships that he was holding hostage because of security cones in international waters to the uh, Bosphorus Gulf. That was agreed to finally, and Ukrainian grain did leave. However, the poorest countries on the World Food Programme's list, there was a terrible situation in Burkina Faso and another country as well, the Europeans, we pointed out to them that almost half of this grain was going to them. We were told that it would then be reshipped re to African countries. But nevertheless, one way or another, it is operating. As for the Russian side of the deal, 
the Russian part of the deal, neither food nor fertiliser. Uh, as a heading is uh, as as a line is indicated in the sanctions of the European Union and the United States, but other things are mentioned, for example, Russian vessels docking in European ports, the docking of foreign vessels in Russian ports. Sanctions are imposed on Rosselhoz Bank, the main agricultural bank in the country, which services the lion's share of all fertilizer and food deals and transactions, and of course, against the backdrop of these threats that the West is flying around left, right and center. The insurance rate for our vessels has increased fourfold. The Secretary General in that part of the 22nd of July agreement that pertains to Russian grain is obliged to get the European Union and the United States to lift these obstacles. I met with him the day before yesterday and he confirmed that he, there is still a lot of work to be done. As he has said publicly, there are still barriers, but uh, they are giving him some promises. So everything is in the hands of the hegemons who are trying to shift the blame onto us. Because nobody went hungry when the USA was bombing Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya for years, Syria now, when the war is ongoing in Yemen. Did that have an impact on global markets? No, it didn't. But that's because uh, back then there were commanders who were exercising their sense of all-powerfulness. And then suddenly those Americans decided that they would not allow crops, the Russian language, the culture to be destroyed. That's the difference. And that's when this package of sanctions was ramped up, something that no one has ever seen before, and which was introduced without any concern about those developing countries which would be impacted by the sanctions as they have been. Thanks for doing this. Alan Darga from MTV Lebanon. Can you please elaborate more? What's the role of the Saudis and the Turkish in easing the crisis? They showed will to uh, join forces maybe to help maybe solve this big crisis that's happening between these two nations. And can you tell us if they are communicating with each other before uh, bringing any draft or any try uh, to give any help to the Russians? Uh, many are proposing their mediation uh, services to us. With respect to Turkey, Turkey played a very useful role when it invited uh, parties uh, to Istanbul, the Ukrainians, the Russians, and representatives of the United Nations where a deal was reached, which I mentioned. Now, we are expecting from the Secretary General and from the Turkish side, because they are now parties to the agreement, we are awaiting from them that they seek to ensure that the Europeans and the Americans lift those barriers that I mentioned for the implementation of the Russian part of the deal. Because the Russian grain on world markets represents an immeasurably greater share, far more significant than Ukrainian grain. I didn't even mention, incidentally, 300,000 tons of fertilizer have been shut in European ports, not being released. And for approximately a, a month and a half ago, we said our companies are willing uh, to, uh, to, to abandon the rights to the fertilizer for them to be quickly sent to developing countries in need. And this is something which many are very interested in. The European Union for a month and a half has been thinking and thinking, unable to take a decision. The fertilizer is no longer ours. It is uh, now in the hands of the European Union. Let them give the fertilizer to the countries who are on the list of the World Food Program. Turning to Saudi Arabia, there was an announcement that the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman participated in the agreement on the details of an exchange that was held. Uh, their mediation services is uh, something which many have been proposing this to us, but we wish to understand what will come of this. Without any mediators, in March, in late March of this year, 
we reached an agreement with the Ukrainian delegation on the principles for a settlement. Those principles, which the Ukrainians themselves set out, we accepted them without any changes whatsoever. And the next day, changes began. They said, well, this isn't right here. It should be different here. And then the provocation occurred in the city of Bucha, where the Russian the troops who withdrew from the area as a gesture of goodwill liberated the area. A mayor emerged of the city for two days. He spoke on television, described life there. And on the third day, the, the broad street was broadcast where corpses were littered about for two days, being in one city for two days. The mayor and his entire team and uh, discovering this on a, a major central street on the third day, well, that's actually a mockery. I would like you, too, to, uh, to exert influence on Ukrainians and their friends. For a number of months now, we have been requesting, because everybody insisted, a meticulous investigation into the events in Bucha. For a number of months, we have been asking for the names of these people whose corpses were broadcast on television and, the, and on the internet. The answer is complete silence. I even mentioned this during a Security Council meeting. And I then requested for a, a polite meeting, uh, uh, during, during a meeting, I asked uh, Mr. Guterres whether uh, he could get involved in this for an explanation. A scandal was created. This was used for another package of anti-Russian sanctions. There were demands for an investigation. And the first step to an investigation is what? At least to establish the identity of those individuals which the Russian army allegedly killed uh, in an atro uh, with such brutality. And then recently there was this story with the city of Izum where there was an announcement of a grave, a mass grave of tortured Ukrainian residents and uh, a, a, a cemetery was shown with graves indeed, but no mass grave. Every um, a grave had an orthodox cross, so people were interred. They were buried, and the Ukrainians began to unearth them. For your investigation, there was interest from a host of journalists, foreign correspondents, to travel to the area to see this for themselves, and the Ukrainian leadership is not allowing them in. And as for Zoom, nobody's writing anything anymore. This is something that is noteworthy. Please pay attention to this. Now is a time when there is a temptation to sensationalism, but interest in uh, those who create these sensations without checking the facts. This is rising under these circumstances and in these times. In regions of this ballroom, Evelyn and Edith. Please, two questions, one by one. How do you do? Um, you have spoken in detail about NATO encroachment. Do you see, perhaps after this war ends, that whether you call it a war or not seems to be one, um, any kind of talks with the United States to make Russia feel more secure about what you call NATO encroachment. Well, you know, I've already said today, and I'll repeat it again, we're not saying no to contacts. And when proposals to that effect come in, we agree. If our partners want to meet quietly so that nobody finds out about it, that's fine, because it's always better to talk than not to talk. But in the present situation, Russia is quite simply not going to make the first step. Everything was destroyed back in 2014 when the European Un Union destroyed the architecture of relations we developed with the European Union. We've told them that when they have an interest in something, they should let us know. We would have an interest in that. Just wait and see. And then on NATO, in the peak of the talks of how we should establish European security, 
they expelled almost all of the staff of our mission to NATO, apart from eight people who were left, a driver and some technical staff, which is not serious at all. So we closed that mission, or at least suspended its operations. Those mediators that are stepping forward, I've responded to them. We've heard lots of proposals to that end. I said, well, listen to Mr. Zelensky, who said that we'll beat Russia, we'll liberate everything, and in my peace plan, there's no neutrality provided for, with the idea that they need to be accepted into NATO. Do you know how the Americans view Europe? There was a phrase that be the Ukrainian nationalists started uh, saying a long time ago, Ukraine is Europe, but I think the Americans would like to say the opposite. They'd like to say Europe is Ukraine. Kuleba in response to the question of whether Ukraine wants to enter NATO after Zelensky uh, said that there's no space for neutrality in our peace plan, Kuleba said, well, now NATO is going to join Ukraine rather than Ukraine joining NATO, maybe for political uh, satire. That is a, a promising thing. But if they come to us, we'll consider it, but we're not going to take the first step. We've drawn the conclusion that they are in no way willing to negotiate. They are um, selfish through and through. They are egotistical, and they think only about themselves and their interests. A balance of interests is not something that they will respect or even pursue. The representative of Reuters asked, and then someone from Germany. The nature of those questions is something that the elite in Western countries needs in order to continue to demonize Russia. But those questions did not reflect any interest whatsoever in the way that you asked your question about perhaps there could be dialogue. So let's see. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, and um, you're back in an old home. <laughs> um, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, this week, we have listened to heads of state and heads of government repeatedly call for an end to this conflict in Ukraine, which has had global ramifications. Mm -hmm. We've also heard um, military experts saying that um, there seems to be no desire on either side to negotiate because they believe that they can win militarily. Um, how would you respond to both of those um, views? I have already responded partially. I will once again state, as soon after the launch of our military of our operation, the, uh, the Ukrainian side proposed the beginning of negotiations to find a way to settle the situation. We consented. A number of rounds of these negotiations was held, first in Belarus, then online, during which the Ukrainians couldn't even understand what they were proposing, uh, couldn't even explain what they were proposing. Then there was a proposal for Istanbul, 29 March, during which we were uh, sent a paper setting out the principles for the settlement, uh, and to this um, paper we responded favorably without any change whatsoever to those principles. And uh, we uh, put those principles on in the language of a treaty. We handed them over to U the Ukrainian side. Then there was Bucha, which I mentioned, and the names of the victims, which we uh, continue to wish to see, and we will continue to ensure that this be uh, done. Then the Ukrainians told Ukraine, don't 
agree to an agreement with Russia. Right now, you need to gather successes on the battlefield. Burrell, who should be dealing with uh, diplomacy, the main diplomat, said that this conflict needs to be resolved on the battlefield with a victory of Ukraine. Take a listen. Well, you listened to, to Boris Johnson before, but now listen to Liz Truss. They all say approximately the same thing. And NATO, everything else, and Crimea needs to be taken away. What kind of negotiations can be even considered? The last thing that happened in terms of contacts with the Ukrainians was our consent to their paper on the principles for a settlement. After this, they moved in a completely different direction. Read Zelensky's statement the day before yesterday. No compromises, our uh, peace is war, etc. I don't know what else can even be talked about. There is a one group of mediators who I met with here, distinguished international, eminent international regional organizations, and they tell me, let's travel to Kiev and what should be conveyed there. And I said, well, you know, I told them they suspended, halted the talks, after which in the middle of the summer they asked Putin, why has Russia refused uh, negotiations? He responded, we have not refused negotiations, but those who are refusing need to understand that the longer they refuse, the more difficult ultimately it will be to reach agreement and to negotiate. So uh, we again, again, we showed our goodwill. And the other side doesn't uh, wish to embrace this and the parties to travel to Kiev soon. I asked them, did you speak? to the Americans. Have you been speaking to the Americans in terms of your mediation? They fell silent and they said, well, our mandate only includes negotiations with Russia and Ukraine. Why is this serious? Uh, any a thinking person, does, does any thinking person truly not understand that the United States is calling the shots in Ukraine and in, in, in Ukraine and increasingly in London as well? It is all crystal clear. And when the questions are put forward by journalists from Europe, from England, from the United States, why are we not willing to engage in contacts? They prohibit it. I said this. They prohibited uh, the president of Cyprus from having negotiations, from having a meeting with me. One member of the P5, another, also a distinguished, uh, representing a, an eminent side, somehow timidly uh, uh, requested a quiet meeting behind the scenes, and they fell off the radar subsequently, just like another prime minister. So there is no need to label us as uh, someone refusing, a uh, refusenik. Thank you. Thank you. That was the last one. Thank you.